So sorry about that. So I don't think I need to start again by greeting you, right? You did hear that piece, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, there we go. Let's just uh, give this portion of our worship time to the Lord. Father, we humble ourselves before you this morning and in humility we recognize and we proclaim that because of your truth we know that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. As we have just sung, there is no one there is no one who reigns above you. And so, Father, it is a privilege. It is a privilege to be even able to call out your name this morning. And we recognize that we wouldn't even be able to do that unless it was you that opened our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears to be receivers of this knowledge, to be receivers of this wisdom, to be receivers of this truth that you have given to us in your word. God, our, our desire is just to allow you to come and to guide us, and to teach us, to discipline us as needed, but to grow us, most importantly, in our commitment to you. Lord, ground us in your truth this morning by the power of your spirit working through the truth of your word. Be our teacher. Humbly, we pray that you would again open our ears and our eyes, that we would know when we leave this place that we together have been with Jesus. And this we pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. You know, just kind of connecting to what Cindy shared with us this morning, I was reminded that in the very beginning, in the, in, in the opening chapters of Scripture, in Genesis, it says that God created man and woman. And it goes on to tell us that he invited that man and then that woman to be in the garden with him. And, and what that says to me is that God has initiated this connection, this relationship. This isn't something that we have just kind of longed for and stumbled across and, and come to. God of the universe desires today to be in relationship with you. And if you're like me, there's a good chance you've stumbled over a few blocks this past week. But you know what? We, we sang it this morning and we proclaim it again that God is faithful. In fact, his word says even when we're not faithful, he remains faithful. So I kind of just want to lay that as a foundation that this is God's idea to have a relationship with us. This is about what he wants for us. So here in the book of 1 John chapter 4, John shares these words with us. And, and in our study, uh, in our series, Inside Out Living, uh, we're just kind of coming into a portion of uh, Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus where he's going to talk about our love for God and our love for one another. And so I kind of wanted to first step back and help us understand just how important we're on the same page as God when it comes to this thing called love. Because you know, there's a lot of definitions in our world of what love looks like, what love feels like, what love is supposed to be like, but we need to go to the truth to see what love, pure love, really 
is all about. So here in verse 7, beginning at verse 7 of chapter 4, John writes this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Okay, so there it is again. He's the initiator of this love relationship. Love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. The kind of love that, that John is surfacing here, the kind of love that John is talking about to us here, is a, it's a love that's very different from the world's kind of love, okay? This is a, this is a, a pure love. It's an undefiled love. It's a, it's a perfect kind of love. It's the, the kind of love that, that you and I deeply desire to experience deep down in our souls. We want to know it. We want to soak in it. You know what I'm talking about. And John is saying that if you, if, if you don't truly have this love or know this love or live out this kind of love as a follower of Jesus, then you simply don't know God. Why is that? Because God is love, okay? Now, John states, he, he's just made a very strong statement of reality to us. In that statement there, God is calling me to love others with a kind of love that has its source in God, because again, God is love. So I need to rub my life up against God's truth. And as I rub my mind and my heart and my soul and my life against this truth, I have to come to this place of recognizing that God is the ultimate author of love. That's where it starts. I I love being loved. I can't say that it's, that it's just as easy, however, to impart my kind of love to others. And, and, and the dangerous part of that is that this scripture is saying here that if I don't love like God loves, then I really don't know him. And so the question is this, how can I attain, how can I achieve, how can I connect, how can I impart this, this kind of love? How can I get into this experience of God's love? How can I share it? How can I give, give it away? How can I live in the environment, if you will, of this supreme and divine love? That's, that's the question that's before us. If I want to be secure and have the assurance of, of truly knowing God and being known by him, how then is it that I stay connected? How do I activate? How do I achieve this kind of true, powerful, unconditional kind of love for others because that's what God's calling us to be a part of. Love is the essence, isn't it, of his kingdom. In fact, when somebody asks Jesus, what's the two most important commandments? What do you say? We're to, we're to love God and we're to love others. So we have like two corner posts here to what it means to live in God's kingdom. This whole aspect of love, being loved, loving others. This is what Paul raises for us in this text that, that we're using in our series that we've entitled Inside Out Living. 
And so now I'm going to have you turn back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Essentially, this Inside Out Living series is covering chapter 4, verse 17, through chapter 5, verse 17. And the reason, quite honestly, that we're looking at it is because Paul is given, through the power of the Spirit, um, some very practical ways that, that we're to live out our Christian life. And so that's why we're in this. So in chapter 5 of the book of Ephesians, in verse 1, the very first word that you see there is the word therefore. Because of that word, as we said last week, we need to ask the question, what is that there for? Now understand that that's going to cause us to look back at Paul's train of thought here. And so I really want to go back to verse 31 of the fourth chapter and then follow on from there so that we kind of get the context of what Paul is trying to state in this part of his letter. And I want us to remember, and I need to remind myself of this every once in a while, and I'm sure you do as well, we need to remember that um, this is a communication from the pen of the Apostle Paul to a small church just like ours, and he's writing uh, to this small church in Ephesus. And so what we don't want to do when we read Scripture is to allow the little numbers beside each verse and the bigger numbers beside each chapter to throw us off from the fact, from the reality, that what we are actually reading here is an actual letter. It's a communication, it's a, it's a message, it's a note that, that we might receive uh, something very much like it today in our world. So, as Paul's writing this letter to this church, beginning at verse 31 of chapter 4, this is kind of where we pick up the beginning of a new train of thought that, that Paul is going to give to us. This is what he says. Let all bitterness, in other words, resentment towards others, and wrath, the kind of attitude that says, I'm going to get you back, and anger, I can't stand you, and clamor, I'm shouting at you because I'm so mad at you. And slander, I'm going to find a way to insult you. Let all of that be put away from you along with all malice, which is another word for all kinds of evil. Then in verse 32, the switch goes on, and he says now, be kind, in other words, be generous to one another, tender-hearted, which means caring towards one another, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. Therefore, there we are, verse 1, chapter 5, therefore, because of what I've just said to you, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now let me just give you kind of the bull's eye concept the, I, the general idea here of what Paul is, is trying to say. In our relationship with others, you and I are always to love others just like Jesus loves us. Okay, so just take a moment and let that kind of sink in. In my relationship, my time with others, I'm to always love those around me, those in my sphere of living, just like Jesus loves me. 
So in my relationship um, with you as a, as a Christ follower, I'm to always love you just as Jesus has loved me. And in my relationship with my spouse, and in my relationship with my children, and in my relationship with my parents, and in relationship with my friends, and even in relationship to my enemies, I'm always to love just as Jesus has loved me. So, let me start there at verse 1 and show you how this principle that Paul is writing to us ties back to verses 31 and 32 of chapter 4. The first word we see in that first um, verse of chapter 5, as I've said, is therefore. In other words, because of what, we've, what Paul's just taught, therefore be, okay? The, the Greek word for be is ginomai, and it means to become. It's a verb, and so that means that this is going to involve an action. This is going to involve something that I'm to become in time. Therefore, be imitators of God. Now, the Greek word for imitator here means to follow. In fact, it, it actually means to mimic. Paul is challenging us as Christ followers to become mimickers, to become imitators, to become almost like mirrors of God himself. And here in this part of the letter, the emphasis of mimicking God, the emphasis of following God is placed on loving God. Others. In other parts of the scripture, we're told to be like God in other different kinds of ways. But here, in this portion of scripture, Paul is surfacing how we're to mimic God when it comes to loving one another. So I'm to mimic God's love in my relationship with others regardless of where they might stand in relationship to me, okay? Maybe they've said things that have hurt me. Maybe they've done things that have hurt me. But my responsibility is to be a reflector of the love that Jesus has bestowed upon my life. Now, a follower, an imitator, a mimicker is not someone who simply picks up on the general patterns um, of someone else, but rather a, a, a true mimic is someone who copies very specific characteristics. Now, the, the, the first thing that comes to my mind, um, you know, when you go to Faneuil Hall, there's always people out in the, on the cobblestone. They're trying to raise some money. They're college students, right? And, and, and they'll have a guitar case open up and they'll be singing. Or maybe there's a person who's a mime. I'm not sure. Do you say they're like a mime person or do you just say they're a mime? Does anybody know how you say that? I don't know. Do you just say they're a mime, right, Karen? Is that, yeah, yeah, they're a mime. For a minute I was like, when I was thinking, that doesn't sound right, but okay, they're a mime. Now, those mime people are very good at miming the people they bring out of the crowd, aren't they? They're good mimickers. Like, and they'll go, like, it's not just like they'll pick up on the general thing. It's like they got it right down to, like, you go like this, and they're going to wipe the same hairs on their nose as the person wiped on their nose. So that's the concept of this Greek word. We're to be like 
Jesus. We're to mimic Jesus. So, ironically, what, what kind of comes out of that truth is that 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 statement about being an imitator of God, being a mimicker of God, as a follower of Jesus, I'm actually to become an imitator in all of my life to him. I mean, that's kind of what the Christian life is all about. God wants us to be like him. He says, be holy as I'm holy. He goes so far as to say, be perfect as, as I am perfect. Now, why would I want to do that? What would be the motivation for me to want to be like God? I mean, that just sounds so far out there. It's almost like, I don't know, I don't even know if I, I don't know. I don't know if I even could do that. I don't even know if I want to do that. It just seems like, woo, way out there. So, what we have to understand is that God loves us so much that he wants two very important relationships to be happening all the time in our lives. He wants us to be having a he wants us to be having a relationship with him on a moment by moment basis every day. And he wants me also to be having healthy uh, nutritious uh, kinds of a relationship with others, okay? They, he wants a, a thriving relationship to be happening vertically and a thriving, loving relationship to be happening horizontally. So that is why he sets down before us this standard, this expectation, because pure and healthy relationships blossom as we receive and then cultivate God's love for us personally. Like he's saying, this is a really good thing. You choose to follow me, and I'm going to show you the way to experience abundant life. That's the motivation. He wants a good relationship with us vertically. He wants us to have good relationships with other, each other horizontally. We said last week that we can't really, truly love others until we first are receivers of God's love for us. Now, I can say this morning, do you love Jesus? And I know every one of you is going to say, absolutely, yes, I do. But let me ask it again. Do you really love Jesus because you've recognized just how much he truly loves you? Like, have you drank from the source of love? Have you allowed that, that living water to, to spring up and through and out of your life? Or are you kind of just hoping that your love is pure and undefiled? You see, I can't give what I don't have. And I can't give the kind of love that Jesus wants me to give unless I've received that love and I'm living in that love. And this is why it says in verse 1 of chapter 5, be imitators of God as beloved children. We took all last week to talk about that. So, let's backtrack a little bit. When Paul says here that you and I are to be imitate, imitators of God, he's really following up on what he just said, what he um, just gave to us in verse 31 and 32. And there Paul said, now remember, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and public yelling and private whispering behind backs be put away from you, along with all forms of evil, with all forms of malice. So let's remember and understand that each of those characteristics are part of our old sinful nature. That's part of our old self. And 
what we want to understand is those traits, those characteristics are what? They're actually the opposite of what love really is. When you're bitter, when you're bitter towards somebody and you have a grudge against them and you're angry, whether that's a, a blast of, of verbal hurtful words or maybe there's just this inside smoldering anger that's going on, understand that any and all of those feelings and actions are the opposite of what we're called to mimic as followers of God. So these characteristics that Paul gives us are simply descriptions, they're, they're explanations, they're, they're pictures of pre-Christ life, life before we met Jesus. And what should be the new characteristics that develop and flourish and blossom when we receive Christ into our life, when we, we receive and experience his love and his forgiveness and his kindness? Well, look, verse 32 gives us the answers. It says, be kind to one another. Be tenderhearted, forgiving as Christ forgave me. Those are what? Those are descriptions, those are qualities, those are characteristics of this thing that God calls love. And he goes on to say, love is, love is kind, love is tender, and most of all, love is what? It is forgiving. Love is forgiving. You see, we have to understand, we have to grasp this truth that it's a lack of forgiveness towards others that allows bitterness to smolder inside of me. It's a lack of forgiveness that makes me begin to, to get angry and wrathful. And, and, and it's an in unforgiving spirit that wants to that just make me want to hurt you and, and say things against you. It's a lack of forgiveness that, that makes me go to the point of slandering your name and insulting you and whispering behind your back and, and kind of just holding all of this evil over you. And the reason that I don't forgive, quite frankly, is that what? Is that I don't have a love for you like Jesus has for me. You see how it's all tied together? You see, the best way that I can measure whether or not I'm truly loving is, is, is simply this. This is the test. When you hurt me, when you speak against me, when you assault my self-identity, when you injure my, my, my self-esteem, am I still willing to forgive you and to love you like Jesus has forgiven me and loving me, loved me. The greatest measuring tool of love is whether we're willing to forgive those who have hurt us. And you see, this is precisely, what I want you to see here is that this is precisely the way God presents his love to us. You see, we could say, oh, God, God so loved the world that, that he made the most incredibly beautiful mountains and valleys. Or we could say, oh, God so loved the world that he made just incredibly beautiful and handsome men and beautifully uh, structured women. God so loved the world that he made incredibly delicious foods. Now that's all nice to think about, but there's something missing there, isn't there? You see, God so loved the world that he took a whole bunch of, of dirty, rotten, revolting, God-hating sinners, and he died on the cross 
to bear, to assume their sins so that he could then bring them into a place where he could now have this relationship again with them. Because you see, in the Garden of Eden, when when God created Adam and Eve, initially, his spirit dwelt in them, and that's why they were able to have fellowship. But when sin came, something got removed. And you know what got removed? That spiritual nature. And so, God could have turned his back on humanity at that point and said, they made a bad choice and I'm just going to move forward. But that's not what he did. Throughout history, God began to show his love by saying, someday I'm going to send a savior to bring you back to a place where you can then have my spirit dwelling in you so that we can have this relationship that I long to have with you. That's an incredible truth. That's an incredible reality that's placed before us. It says, um, let me see the, the verse here. It says in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John, Jesus is here praying to the Father. And and, and I want you to hear these incredible words that, that Jesus uses as he's praying to the Father about those who are going to be followers of him, who are going to be true Christians, who are going to be believers. In verse 22 of that 17th chapter, this is what Jesus prays. He says, I have given them the glory that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and, now listen, that you love them as much as you love me. Did you just hear that? God the Father this morning loves you and myself as much as he loves his own son, Jesus. And he loves you so much that he's not going to force this relationship upon you. He's going to give you the opportunity to choose whether you will be a follower of him and be a receiver of this love or whether you will reject it. But this you need to know. If you truly are a son or daughter of the living God, you will strive to forgive from your heart You'll strive to love from your heart because you will be a recognizer that God has loved you this deeply, that he was willing to forgive your every sin so that we can then forgive every sin committed against us. Listen to these words from Dwight L. Moody. He says this, If we have got the true love of God shed abroad in our hearts, we will show it in our lives. We will not have to go up and down the earth proclaiming it. We will simply live it out in everything that we do and everything that we say. We have to stay connected to the source of love, and that's Jesus himself. This is why he has granted us his spirit, because in and of ourselves, we can't produce this kind of love. But he's the vine, and we're the branches. And we stay connected to him, and my love for you, and your love for me, will be pure and undefiled. And we will then whether it's here in church, whether it's in our neighborhood, whether it's in our home, 
whether it's in our workplace, we will then truly love others as Jesus commands us to love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which is truth. And Lord, we ask that you would take this truth, that you would plant it in our hearts, that it might grow, that it might produce the kind of fruit that only you can produce in us and through us. We thank you for the depth of your love towards us. Lord, might we have willing hearts to replicate that love to others. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.